Exclusively on Secular Media Network, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto. Hello and welcome to the Gaytheist Manifesto, your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate. At the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement, I am your host, Callie Wright, flying solo this week. Um, this week is going to be a little different than most episodes. I've gotten a lot of questions about my weight loss journey and weight loss surgery and, and all of that fun stuff. So um, this week's episode basically is just going to be me sort of monologuing, telling the story. Um, the story is obviously not over. I had my surgery on December 21st. Um, it's, I mean, it's really a lifelong journey, but, um, I expect things to be settled relatively into normal in maybe a year, year and a half or so. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of start at the beginning. Um, I actually first sort of wanted weight loss surgery years ago when uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine had it. And, um, I, I think then my reasons, at least for me, were the wrong reasons. It was, you know, I want to be skinny. I want to look good. Now, like that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, those you know, wanting to feel like you look good is not obviously a bad thing, but I, I, I was motivated a hundred percent by vanity and very little by actual practical health reasons. And, um, I had a very bad model and my girlfriend, she did basically nothing. The doctors told her to, and, uh, ended up with a bowel obstruction that almost killed her. Uh, she lost a whole bunch of weight, gained more than she lost back. Uh, so it was a complete and utter waste of time. And, um, so, you know, seeing that gave me a very, a very good model for what not to do and how seriously a thing this is uh, to take, because, uh, you know, if you screw it up, it can kill you. Like it, it can, you can literally die. Um, I've struggled with my weight pretty much my entire life. I mean, I remember I started to get chubby right around, uh, like fourth or fifth grade. Um, and, and it's just kind of gone up ever since, uh, the, the highest weight I ever had was 403 pounds. That's, that's how much I weighed at the, at the very beginning of this journey six months ago when I started seeing my uh, weight loss doctor that eventually did my surgery. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think my motives are, better now, at at least for me. I I don't want to try and attach morality to other people's motivations, but, um, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's getting my sleep apnea under control and maybe not having to use my CPAP anymore. Um, you know, using a CPAP is not anymore the gigantic, horrible inconvenience it used to be. Uh, if I have to use it for the rest of my life, I'm not going to be bummed about it, but it'd be cool to not need it. Um, it's about, you know, preventing joint problems and it's about lowering my risk for obesity related health problems like diabetes and heart disease and, and those kinds of things that, that have a history in my family. So I know I'm already at increased risk and I wasn't helping myself by being at the extremely high weight that I was. And I mean, still am because I'm still kind of, you know, at the beginning of this journey. And, uh, and, and it's something that I really struggled with. Um, I, I've never actually had low self-esteem specifically because, you know, I'm fat, therefore that means I'm ugly, therefore that means I'm worthless. That, that really hasn't been the thinking in my mind. What I have struggled so much with was the fact that when I decided like, gosh, you know, I'm getting winded going across the parking lot. And if I go for a walk for a half hour, my knee starts to hurt. Like, that's really scary. I don't want to deal with those things at 32 years old. So I've got to get my weight under control. So I've decided that I want to do something about it. Why can't I just take control and make this happen? Um, Generally speaking, I'm a pretty ambitious person. I, when I decide I want to do a thing, I take a deep dive and I make it happen. That's usually how things work for me. And it's never been able to work like that for me as far as weight goes. Uh, It was the, the one, not the only thing, but one of the very few things in my life that I felt utterly and completely powerless in the face of, um, you know, it's the classic stuff, crave carbs, crave fats. And if my body didn't get enough of it, it protested. I mean, it was like, it was like a red alarm tunnel vision going off in my head. I would try to eat what I thought would be a reasonable portion of even unhealthy food. Like, like I would have a cheeseburger and a big ass baked potato. And, and I would think like, this is okay. This is not healthy food, but this is at the least a reasonable amount of food for an adult my size. 
And I would eat that and I would not be able to function until I ate more, until I had another cheeseburger, until I had another baked potato. Um, so, uh, you know, for a while I actually had myself convinced that I had an undiagnosed eating disorder and, um, you know, may, maybe that should have been the first step, but I, I, I sort of just gave in and just gave my body what it was screaming at me that, uh, that I wanted. And so I, you know, just sort of moved on from there. And, um, you know, I, I kind of had a breakdown one night and, uh, I believe it was a listener to the show. Um, I feel really, really bad because I don't remember the guy's name who recommended this book to me, but this, this book is called the diet fix. And it's 100% evidence-based. The guy's a doctor. It's not a fad diet. It's all based in actual, you know, peer-reviewed scientific studies. Um, you know, the, the guy is a doctor who applies these mes- methods with his patients and gets success. And and I started looking at the numbers. I started looking at the research and, you know, what works for weight loss? How how are people successful? And, you know, how how likely am I to be able to do this on my own? And uh, what I found was not happy, honestly, Um, they say 90, 95% of diets fail. I forget where that number comes from, but it's a real number. Um, almost everyone who tries is able to lose some amount of weight and 95% of people gain it back, even if it's a significant amount. And I found, you know, in, in my research, um, the most reliable, effective, long term way to lose weight and keep it off is bariatric surgery. Uh, you know, there may come some miracle drug that can just, you know, raise your metabolism and and let you do what you want at some point, but that's not the reality. And, uh, you know, I'm still young at 32 years old. Uh, but you know, I am getting to the point where my body is changing and it's not going to just take me doing whatever I want to it anymore. I have to actually take care of my body if I want it to last me a long time. So I decided that, um, you know, I was, I was going to do this. I was going to try this. And, uh, and, and I honestly, I can't recommend the book highly enough. I've tried to get the author on the show. He won't respond to my emails, but, um, you know, basically it, it's very practical things to say, you know, here are steps that you can take. And, and, and if you've, if you've ever heard, uh, you know, a dietitian or, uh, you know, someone who's a specialist in weight loss, that's worth their salt talk. I mean, this is all stuff that's going to be familiar. You focus on protein, you eat fewer calories than you take in. You do moderate amounts of exercise, make sure you weigh and measure everything that you eat and make sure you record everything that you eat. And, uh, and it's all sort of about rearranging your lifestyle to fit what, uh, you know, to, to, to be conducive to uh, weight management and to, to, you know, weight loss or, or even weight gain. If that's your goal, if you're, if you're, if you're a person that feels you need to lose weight or just to maintain your weight, if it fluctuates a lot and you feel like, you know, I just want to, I just want to maintain this. Um, you know, you can, you can sort of fudge those numbers to whatever your goal is. And, um, and, and that's why, you know, this, I, I think this is a good discussion, even for people who aren't interested in weight loss surgery, because I mean, I was able to lose almost 60 pounds before my surgery, um, just from, from diet, really, I didn't even exercise that much. Um, so, uh, so, so, uh, you know, I decided, okay, I'm, it's, it's one of those things. It sounds like a clickbait headline. It's like, you know, 10 steps, blah, blah, blah. And it's like a 10 day kind of reset. And, uh, and I mean, I had my skeptic radar on a hundred percent, you know, looking for buzzwords, looking for, you know, cleansing and toxins and, and all those sort of like pseudoscience wooey buzzwords. And and they weren't there. Um, it was, you know, here's what the research says. Here's the paper. So you can go check it out. And, uh, and, and it's very practical things. The guy doesn't have anything to sell, but the book He's you know, you go buy a food scale. You can get one for 10 bucks at the grocery store, you know, make sure you've got good measuring cups. Um, you know, make sure you've got, you know, a smartphone to journal your food in or a, a little book or, oh, here's this sheet that I made. You can download from my site for free to journal your food. And, um, and so I started doing that and, and I recognized, obviously I was eating way too much and, uh, and, and the, the whole thing is about finding foods that you enjoy that you can eat in reasonable amounts so you can find a diet, and, and I don't mean diet in the like I'm on a diet sense. I mean diet as in these are my eating habits sense. Um, I was able to find a balance where I was eating reasonable amounts of food that I genuinely enjoyed, uh, but that was the right amount for me to create that caloric deficit, and and I was able to lose weight doing that. 
And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, one of the things that he says is, um, you know, his, his whole thing is your ideal weight is the weight at which you can ideally enjoy life while, uh, you know, doing a diet that's conducive to that. Um, if you torture yourself, you're never going to stick with, uh, with what you're doing. If you're torturing yourself, if you, if you hate it, if you're miserable, if you're eating food that you hate, you're just not going to stick with it. Human beings just, we're just not wired that way. We're fighting against our biology. You know, we, we involved in an environment of scarcity where, uh, you know, we have to eat everything we get our hands on because we don't know what our next meal is going to be. And fats taste so good because they're so unavailable. Sugar tastes so good because it's so unavailable. And those are things that our body needs, albeit in small amounts. And now they're unlimited. Like you can go out and, you know, you can have a hundred grams of sugar and, you know, a, a, a couple of sodas, you know? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's kind of the problem. Uh, one of the things that my weight loss surgeon likes to say is that we're never going to solve the obesity problem until we solve the problem of the fact that a cheeseburger is a dollar and a salad is $7. And, uh, you know, obviously it's a lot more nuanced than that, but I, I, I think there's a lot to that. Um, so environment is a thing and in retooling your environment to be supportive of those changes is a big thing. So, um, you know, I, I don't remember like the entire like 10 day reset. And, and I honestly think the guy deserves the book sales for this because it's, it's good, practical science based, effective stuff, uh, that, that, 100% worked for me and it's, and it's evidence-based, which is something that uh, you hear a lot of claims for in weight loss stuff, but there usually isn't. Usually their scientific research is like a survey of 10 people who had success with their product that they paid for the results and that kind of stuff. Uh, But this is actual good scientific peer reviewed stuff. Um, So, so literally uh, my regimen was that I figured out what's my metabolism each day. And, um, there's a, uh, there's a calculator on his websites, the, the dietfix.com. There's calculators everywhere. Uh, and it basically asks you to put your height and your weight and it'll estimate what your metabolism is each day. And basically what that means is how many calories you burn sitting still, like what your body burns just by functioning as a body. And then obviously if you eat less than that, then your body burns calories and therefore you lose weight. If you eat more than that, your body stores calories. Therefore, you gain weight. Um, and, you know, there, there are some complicated interactions there, but that, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how it works. You know, it's, it's just calories in, calories out. It's, it's generally speaking as practical as that. And obviously, you know, there are going to be some health conditions and that kind of stuff that, that negate that. But generally speaking, that seems to be uh, sort of what's, what's normal in the sense of, you know, what happens 50% plus one of the time. I don't mean normal as in like what's morally okay, but, um, you know, what happens more than half the time, uh, that, that seems to be typical. And so I found this number and I said, okay, here's how much weight I want to lose per week. And it spits out a number and says, here's how many calories you should be eating a day. So I had five meals a day, uh, three meals and two snacks, And, um, I had, it was basically 400 calories in each meal, 200 calories in each snack, 20 grams of protein per meal, 10 grams of protein per snack. And, and and, I mean, that was basically it. I made a hundred percent sure that I weighed and measured everything that I ate. And, uh, and, and I, I honestly, that was really it. That was how I was able to lose 60 pounds before my weight loss surgery. Uh, liquid calories are a bad thing. I, almost entirely stopped caffeine, not entirely, but almost entirely stopped it and eventually did stop it about two months before surgery completely. Um, and I probably won't be able to go back to it cause it dehydrates you pretty bad. Um, nothing carbonated, nothing, uh, basically liquid calories are bad. So like water, crystal light, power rate zero, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, liquid calories are bad cause they don't contribute to any sense of fullness. Uh, you don't usually get any nutrition out of them and, uh, you still get the calories from them. So liquid calories are bad. Um, I was lucky in that I honestly enjoy drinking cold water. I can drink cold water all day and not really miss flavored things for the most part. Um, uh, I know that's not the case for everybody. So that's one of the things that made it uh, a little easier on me. And, um, and so I did that and, you know, just focusing on, you know, my primary thing has to be protein because, uh, generally speaking, protein kills hunger. 
So if you're getting a decent amount of protein in each meal, that kills your appetite. And that was true for me. I was shocked. Like I said, I, I honestly thought I had an undiagnosed eating disorder going into this whole thing. And I found that when I started concentrating on getting, you know, good quality protein in each meal and eating that often, I stopped being hungry. Like I legitimately was eating on a schedule and I almost never actually felt hungry. And, um, you know, things just started to, to kind of melt away. Uh, you know, and, and the interesting thing about exercise is that, um, you know, I'm not a doctor, honestly. So like I've read some of these studies, I'm going to be honest and say they don't make a ton of sense to me because there's a lot of, you know, jargon and language and stuff like that. But, um, you know, generally if you look at the abstracts and the conclusion, you can sort of, you can sort of gather what they're saying. And what's really interesting is that, Exercise is terrible for weight loss, generally speaking, according to what you know the research says. Um, you know, there's there's a, a great video that I'll try to remember to link in the show notes of this guy Yanni Friedhoff, the guy who wrote the book, talking about all of these different studies and all of these different studies. What they show is that exercise is fantastic for overall health, but as a tool for weight loss, it's basically useless. And you know, the idea is that you know you can walk for two hours or you cannot eat a bag of chips for the day. Like that's literally what, uh, like a small snack bag of chips for the day. Um, so his, his saying is that you can't outrun your fork and that diet has to be the primary thing with weight loss and that exercise is essential. Exercise is really important, but it's more of an overall health tool as opposed to a weight loss tool. And, and I actually, I, I found that to be true, you know, in my case as well. I, I exercised for a little bit. I started getting some pain in my knees and I stopped and my weight loss did not change at all. Um, I, I definitely felt a little better when I was active overall, but as far as the weight loss goes, it really didn't make a difference for me. And I've heard some people say it does for them. Um, obviously everyone's individual situation is going to be different. I'm just, you know, sort of going over the generalities of what I've learned and, and what's worked for me. Um, obviously anybody who's attempting anything like this should probably be, um, at least to some degree under a doctor's care if that's possible. Um, but, uh, but I mean, th- th- you know, that was basically it. There's no... There's no big secret. There's no like secret formula or anything like that. Uh, for uh, many or most people, this is a thing that I, I think can probably work. Um, you know, again, there are a lot of medical conditions, mitigating circumstances that, that can, they can change that. And so like, you know, I don't want to make any sort of general pronouncements. Like my least favorite phrase in the world is like, well, if I could do it, anyone can't. No, that's, I hate that. God, I hate that so much. But um, what I can say is that this stuff is evidence-based there are always going to be outliers. You may be an outlier, but this is, this is the stuff that's evidence-based. This is the stuff that's, that's at, at the least, I can say it's worked extremely, extremely well for me, uh, and, and my circumstances coming from a person who, um, I mean, would lay in bed crying and sobbing, uh, at night feeling worthless because I had no control over my food intake. I was able to turn it around that quickly doing this stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I was kind of on autopilot for a while and, uh, you know, just doing the thing, you know, doing my weekly checkup visits and, uh, you know, my doctors were super impressed with my progress. Uh, you know, every, I think every doctor loves a patient that actually does what the doctor says to do. Um, and so they loved me because, you know, I have this, this weird idea that if I go to a weight loss doctor and say, Hey, how can you help me lose weight? And he's like, here's the things you should do. I think that it's probably generally a good idea to just go ahead and do those things. So, uh, so I did. And, uh, my doctors loved me and, and, and honestly, I love my doctors and the people at the office. They were all great. Um, you know, no issues with, you know, being trans or anything like that. I was pretty upfront, you know, when they ask about your motivations, you know, why you want to do weight loss surgery, um, you know, cause they want to make sure that you don't have this lofty, like this is going to solve all my problems and it's going to be zero effort for me kind of things. Um, so I was straight up about, you know, one of my big motivations is that I need to get to a certain weight before I can have bottom surgery. Uh, and I was very upfront about that and they thought that was a great motivation to have. And they were, you know, very excited for, for that part of my journey. Uh, so, so I felt really good about that. And, um, and, and so that's as far as the food and exercise thing, I mean, that's, that, that's pretty much it. Like there's not really a ton more to it. Um, and then, you know, that, that kind of leads into my actual journey with, with weight loss and, uh, and the, the, the surgery. 
And uh, so the way that my insurance company work things is that you have to go through this six month program where you see a doctor repeatedly, uh, you know, once a month for six months while they kind of supervise your diet and weight loss. So I would go to these appointments and I would, uh, you know, talk to the person who gets my blood pressure and that kind of stuff. And then uh, the dietitian would come in and say, you know, take me through what you eat every day. And I would go through what I was eating because I was you know, pretty diligent about keeping a food journal. And, um, you know, and they would give me some pointers like, you know, maybe do this instead or maybe do this instead. And, uh, but you know, what you're doing is working for you. So, um, you know, you can stick mostly to that, but like, maybe here's how you could tweak a thing or two. And, um, and then I would see the doctor or the, uh, the nurse practitioner that worked there, both, both men that I am deeply in love with at, th- at this point. They're just awesome people. Um, and then, so, um, the company that I work for was bought by a bigger company And I found out that our insurance was changing and I didn't think anything of it at first because in my mind, like all of the big corporate insurances cover bariatric surgery. Like why wouldn't they? It's, it's, it's got decades of research behind it. It's overwhelmingly successful. Like there's just no logical reason why anyone would not cover the surgery. So like I was freaking out about whether or not they were going to continue to cover trans surgeries. Um, and it turns out they, they do cover that too, thankfully. And then uh, I hear from a friend at work who works in another department that our new insurance actually doesn't cover bariatric surgery. And I was like, wow, it's a really good thing. I had my date scheduled December 21st. I had it in before our insurance changed. So like, okay, I'm good. Like, whew, wipe sweat off my forehead, deep breath kind of thing. And then she tells me, well, I was told that the final approvals had to be through December 1st. Or the insurance company isn't going to cover it because the insurance is changing. And of course, I immediately proceeded to freak out. And no one in my insurance companies had any answers. No one in my HR had any answers. Um, So, you know, eventually I got to where it was my last visit. They went in and submitted everything to my insurance for final approval. And uh, and I was in limbo. Uh, At this point, I was on a a full liquid diet, uh, basically doing nothing but like cream of chicken soup, tomato soup, pudding, protein shakes. Like it was, it was kind of miserable. And, and all this time, like freaking out about whether or not I'm actually going to be able to get this surgery. And then I get thrown another curveball, and I'm on the phone with uh, the nurse that works for my insurance company. And she says, oh, okay, it looks like they put everything through on December 7th for the approval which makes sense. My last appointment was December 6th. So they put all the paper through the the paperwork through the 7th. Makes perfect sense. And then she goes, well, you know, they have 15 days to approve this. So your approval may not come through in time for your insurance date. So at the worst, in most cases, this would mean, oh God, I'm going to have to go through this liquid diet thing again. It's going to be a delay. That's really annoying, but no big deal. But in my case, if I lost my surgery date, the surgery was done. I just, there was no way it was going to happen um, because my surgeon takes the week of Christmas and the week of New Year's off. Uh, and he only does surgeries on Mondays and Wednesdays. Mine was on a Wednesday. My surgery was literally the last day he did surgeries for the entire you know year of 2016. So it's like, if I lose this date, I am done. Like it's over with. I, I, I can't, there's nothing that I can do. And so I'm freaking out, making all the phone calls I can. No one can tell me anything. Uh, basically all I keep being told is like, you're just going to have to wait to hear back from your insurance company about that final approval. And, um, you know, I I was, I was told like vaguely that there was some sort of transitional thing that I would be getting a letter about, um, that I didn't get at that point. And, uh, so literally I think it was about 30 hours before the time my surgery was scheduled. I finally find out that the approval went through. So it was like, you know, immediate relief, I utterly lost my shit on the phone with the the rep from the insurance company who uh, who told me that it was approved. And she was like, are you okay? And I was like, yes, it's just been really emotional and stressful. And she was like, well, you know, good luck with everything. And um, so, yeah, so I was, and, you know, I was doing my, my full liquids at that point, <laughs> drinking literally nothing but water and crystal light. And that was miserable. Um and, uh, and, and so, but at that point, everything was on, I was, I was good to go. And, uh, you know, so leading up to the surgery for, for the two weeks prior, they have you on what they call full liquids, which, you know, basically, you know, like I said before, it's, you know, you can do like, uh, low fat soups, uh, that, uh, and even vegetable soups are okay. 
um, because it's it's the the fat and carb profiles, I guess, that are the important thing, not that it's actually liquid. Um, so like vegetable soup was cool, and um, and so I had a ton of like vegetable soup and and tomato soup and cream of chicken soup and pudding and protein shakes, and that was that was kind of my life for two weeks. And uh, the idea with that is actually it's it's not necessarily to jumpstart weight loss, but it's to uh, decrease the fat in your liver because when they go inside your stomach, they actually have to kind of pull your liver aside, I guess, to get to the stomach. So if you can shrink that down using that liquid diet, uh, it makes the surgery a lot safer, makes it easier for the surgeon to do, uh, and it and it uh, lessens your recovery time because they have to do less digging around inside there. So um, so I did that. I, st- I, st- I stuck to it. I made it through it without, without any cheating at all. Um, and, uh, you know, that was kind of miserable, and a day of full liquids was kind of miserable. Um, but you know, I, it it honestly wouldn't have been that bad if I wasn't dealing with the stress of wondering whether or not the surgery was going to happen in the first place. Uh, I I probably would have been of okay because I'm just like, you know, this is motivation. This is, you know, working hard for this goal that I've set for myself for this thing that I want to get and achieve. And, um, I I really don't think it would have been that big, that big of a deal without the extra stress. And, uh, and so, you know, December 21st comes on the, you know, that morning and, um, you know, Celeste and I, I think we went to bed at like three in the morning and I had to get up at like five forty five to get to the hospital. It was, it was, it was terrible. And, um, you know, so I get to the hospital, we get checked in and everything. And, you know, they take me back to the pre-op area and, um, I was kind of mildly nervous. Um, you know, I just never know what to expect and never been under any kind of anesthesia before. Uh, never had any kind of surgery before. Like the most major medical thing I have done to this point is like starting hormones and starting to use my CPAP machine. So it's like, obviously it's just a completely different scale of, I have no idea what the hell is going on here. Um, so, you know, I, I, I get in, you know, they're asking me the million questions, asking me my birthday a million times and then that kind of stuff, which is all fine. It's, you know, they do it for, to verify information and for safety and make sure I get the right surgery and all of that. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good with that. And, um, you know, finally change into one of those really super fashionable hospital gowns and the, the really, uh, ugly, but super comfortable hospital socks. And, uh, you know, I hop into bed and, and, uh, you know, they had some trouble finding a vein for the IV, which is apparently common, uh, because, you know, they don't let you eat anything and they've got you on liquids and stuff like that. So your blood vessel shrinks. So, um, apparently that's not a, a super uncommon thing, but they actually, they actually ended up having to run the IV directly into my right wrist, which, um, which was kind of painful and, uh, and, and stayed painful kind of through the course of my surgery, which was, which was kind of a fun part of the journey. But, um, uh, you know, and, and after that, it's just kind of answering more of a, a million questions and then waiting. And, um, you know, they, uh, eventually brought Celeste and my mom back and we were able to hang out a little bit before, uh, before it was time for surgery. And, you know, before I know it, you know, my, my surgeon walks by and shakes my hand and, and I, I love this guy. He's, he's, uh, from Egypt and he's just, he's so, he's so like bubbly and he's like, he's like, Hey sunshine, you ready to go? And, um, just, yeah, just awesome. And, uh, you know, before you know it, they're like, yep, yeah, we're ready for you. And I'm like, okay, sweet. And, uh, the anesthesiologist and like, I don't know if they do this, like, like, I don't know if they lie or like they try to just, I, I don't know what it is. Um, the anesthesiologist comes back. He's like, how you feeling? I'm like, eh, you know, I'm a little nervous, but I'm all right. Um, and she's like, oh, we'll give you something for that. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like I'd, I'm not nervous on the level that I'm like freaking out and I'm like, you know, shaking and like need drugs to calm me down. I'm just like, I recognize that I'm about to have a major surgical procedure and I'm a little nervous about that. I feel like that's, I feel like that's normal, but you know, sure enough, about 30 seconds later, I start feeling super lightheaded. It's okay. You know, they put something on my IV. It's fine. And, uh, you, you know, I, again, I've never had any sort of anesthesia or anything like that before. So I have no idea how I'm going to react to this. And, um, so, you know, it's just more and more like sort of lightheadedness and funny feelings as I'm being wheeled back to the operating room. And, and it's interesting. I hear a lot of people say that they sort of lose that memory of almost that entire time. Uh, and, and I, I really, I remember pretty much every second up until I actually went to sleep and, um, you know, and I remember being a little loopy and commenting on how sort of the ceiling of the OR kind of looked like a spaceship and, um, you know, and then I heard the nurse say like, here we go. And then, you know, and then before I knew it, I, I woke up in the recovery room and, 
Um, and I, I was really bummed that I wasn't loopy. Like I was hoping, uh, cause you know, when my ex had her weight loss surgery, uh, we were actually in the recovery area when she woke up and were able to like listen to all of the really funny things that she said when she was still really loopy from the anesthesia. Uh, but I was by myself for, for quite some time in recovery. Uh, my surgery was at like 8.45 in the morning and I don't think I got to my room until like 1 o'clock in the afternoon and I didn't see anyone until then. Um, but but I, I actually have very... Uh, vivid memories of, you know, being in the, in the pre-op area. Like I was drowsy and I was kind of going in and out, in and out of sleep. But I, I remember when I was awake and I was talking to the, the, the post-op nurses and telling them, you know, what my pain levels were and that kind of stuff. And, um, and I did have some really funny dreams. I remember waking up and sort of like really weakly asking the post-op nurse, like, is it, is it really common for you to have weird dreams when you're on anesthesia? And she's like, yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I was like, Okay, because like I was just having a conversation with a squirrel in an astronaut suit, um, but I was asleep. I wasn't hallucinating. There's a difference. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, really, like that's the loopiest thing that happened to me. Um, and then it, it was also about then that I had realized, like, oh, that's right, they put a catheter in while you're asleep, which is um, thankfully th- something that I didn't experience going in. Coming out, it was not fun. Um, and that like, I felt myself like, oh my God, I'm peeing on myself. Oh no, wait a minute. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so something that I obviously am, am always concerned about in medical, uh, areas is, is whether or not people are going to have a problem with me being trans or people are going to be freaked out or weirded out or have a problem with it. And, um, and, and I remember, I don't think the post-op nurse knew I was awake when this conversation was happening. Um, but the operating room nurse and the post-op nurse were having a conversation. And I remember the operating room nurse actually saying very professionally, uh, you know, uh, you know, Callie has a penis, she's transgender. So if you have to check her catheter for any reason, just know that like, there's not an error in the paperwork or anything like that. That's like, we know, we know about that. Um, and, and I mean, I, you know, obviously I think that's a relevant thing for, for a nurse to know. Um, and I was just like, I was like, wow, like even laying there sort of in my like drowsy sort of haze, I was like, wow, that's, that's really cool that she, you know, she, she said it very respectfully, very matter of factly, Hey, here's a thing. And, uh, and and I I remember seeing the post-op nurse just nodding and saying, okay. Um, like, like it was like, it was no big deal. And, um, I, I'd kind of figured that I was in good hands just from the way that I'd been treated, uh, before then, you know, all the nurses were really, really nice and, you know, sort of happy go lucky and, um, and you know, we're just talking and laughing with each other, which is, which is, is awesome. Cause I, I think that's kind of how it should be as long as that's, you know, what the patient wants. I guess, obviously if somebody's having a more serious thing, that may not be the best way to be, but, uh, in, in my situation, it, it really helped me sort of stay calm and feel safe and, uh, and, and not be so worried and, and, you know, realize like I'm, I'm going to be well taken care of here. And, um, you know, so finally, I I guess they were having trouble finding a room for me, which is like part of the reason that it took so long. Because I remember the, the post-op nurse saying a couple of times, like, oh, you're, they're they're cleaning your room. Sorry, you know, it's taking so long, but you know, we'll have you in a room soon. And I remember thinking like, wow, like I don't even really know what time it is. And I'm figuring like, it's a short surgery. Generally speaking, it's like 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So I'm thinking maybe it's 10, you know, 10, 30, 11, maybe. And she's like, oh, it's like 1245. Oh shit. Okay. (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, so eventually I hear, you know, I hear, hear him say the, the room's clear and, uh, sure enough, they, they start wheeling me through the hallways and, um, and then I see, uh, I see Celeste at my door, which was just a beautiful sight, um, because I was feeling really, you know, just drowsy and weird and, and kind of uncomfortable cause it's a, a new situation and, um, you know, her, her being one of the first things that I saw was, was really comforting. And she even bought me this really, really cute stuffed penguin from the, the hospital gift shop, which, uh, which I've fallen in love with. His name is Felipe. And, uh, and, and I sleep with him often now. I, I, I did every night before, but now that I'm sleeping back in bed with Celeste, she's my, she's my cuddle bug. Um, wow. I just used that phrase on ironically. Um, so, um, so, you know, and, and from there, it was just sort of the, the, the minutia of, of recovering. Uh, you know, they had me on Dilaudid, which I guess is like a really powerful narcotic painkiller. And I had one of those, uh, one of those pumps where you can press the button every 30 minutes to self-administer. And, um, 
you know, at first I was doing like every time I saw that light turn, I was like, boom, like I don't want to feel pain because it was it was pretty mild. And, and if I was just laying in bed, laying still, there was really no pain at all. It was only when I moved around that it started to hurt. Um, you hear a lot of people talk about uh, the the gas pain because they they inflate your abdomen with gas uh, to, to make it easier to move around in there. And, uh, and, and it doesn't all come out when the surgery is done. You kind of have to work it out. And, um, you know, when you hear most people talk about their experience, they say that's really where the pain comes from. And you hear different people, you know, give different accounts of it. Some people say it's pretty mild. Some people say it's like the most excruciating pain they've ever felt in their lives. Um, so I, I didn't really know what to expect. Like I have a pretty high pain tolerance, but I've never had surgery before, so I don't really know. And, um, you know, for me, it was mild. I, uh, it was, it was really mild and, and I really feel like the first walk I took worked it out. Um, my, uh, my nurses absolutely loved me because I was a very cooperative patient. I just, um, I, I'm pretty big on, you know, unless I've got a reason to not trust a doctor, you know, they, they tend to be the ones that know what they're doing. If they say you need to be up walking very soon after surgery and very often after surgery to help you recover, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, even if it's not fun and, and, and thankfully it wasn't a super uncomfortable thing for me, especially on the, uh, on the pain pump. Uh, cause that medication was, was working pretty well. And, and it, the only side effect was it made me drowsy. Thankfully it didn't make me feel high or loopy or weird or anything like that. I was just sleepy a lot, which is fine. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I was, you know, I took medication. I didn't really complain when they said like, Hey, you want to take a walk? I'm like, sure. Yeah, let's take a walk. And, um, you know, and they were all kind of cheering me on. I was, you know, making like four or five laps around the, uh, around the, the surgery recovery floor. And, um, you know, and, and things were pretty great and I was, I was feeling really good. Um, obviously, you know, hospitals aren't the funnest places, but I feel like, I feel like it was, you know, the best situation it could be. You know, the nurses I had were very, very cool. Um, you know, weren't, they weren't afraid to have a little bit of a conversation with you here and there. It wasn't like in and out, you're a robot and all we're doing is giving you drugs kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I felt like they genuinely cared about what they were doing and they, you know, cared about helping people, which, which I thought was cool because I know that's not a universal thing as much as we would like it to be. And, um, you know, so we spent the night in the hospital and, um, obviously, you know, they come in and wake you up every couple hours to get your vitals. And, um, you know, she kept the, the poor lady kept apologizing to me cause I'm sure she gets yelled at so much. And I was just like, eh, you gotta do what you gotta do. Like I'm on some pretty heavy pain meds. Trust me. I'm going to be out about a 30 seconds after you walk out that door. And, uh, and that's really what it was. So it was, it was not that big of a deal. And then, um, so I was like, wow. And, and at that point I'm like, I'm not pushing the button for the pain meds every 30 minutes. Um, you know, I'm just like, I don't really feel like I need this. Like I'm not hurting that much. And, uh, and, and the nurse did warn me like, you know, it, it, it's cool if you don't need it, but it's better to get out in front of it because if that pain hits you, it's going to take some time for it to, to, to come off if you, you know, hit the, the pump again. So, um, but I mean, I was, I was still like, like, I'm not really feeling a ton of pain here. And then, uh, so the, the day of surgery, you don't get anything at all. Um, there are some doctors who let you do ice chips the day of surgery. My doctor does not. I got these little sponges with, that were, um, lightly, uh, soaked in water so I could sort of wet my mouth. And that was, that was what I got the day of surgery. I mean, obviously I didn't have any appetite because my stomach had just been, you know, just had like 80% of my stomach removed. So I didn't have an appetite. Uh, but you know, my mouth was dry. My throat was dry. My voice was all scratchy. And I'm like, fuck, I just want to sip some water, but you can't do that. Uh, the, the first day. And, uh, and, and so the next morning they wake you up and, and they do what's called a leak test where basically they take you down to radiology. And the first thing that you get to drink after 24 hours of having literally nothing is this bitter ass contrast material. And, um, and you got to drink a pretty good amount of it. So obviously they can, um, you know, follow it through your esophagus and down into your stomach to make sure that your stomach isn't leaking because a leak can be fatal. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I drank that stuff and it was like, I mean, it tasted awful, but it was still fluid and liquid. So it like, it was kind of satisfying in that way. And, uh, they were like, okay, cool. Like you're good to go. And, um, you know, they told me it could take a couple hours to get the labs back, but, uh, you know, I got back up to my room and the nurse practitioner came back and maybe a half hour, 40 minutes later. And he was like, that's the fastest I've ever seen labs done in my life. Um, you know, you're, you're good to go. And just a couple of minutes later, they brought out that pitcher of water and these little one ounce medicine cups. And they were like, you know, you sip water out of these. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. 
And, uh, and sure enough, it was cold water. God, even though I could only sip it a little bit at a time and, uh, and, and I got filled up pretty fast. It was still pretty amazing, um, to, you know, finally have you know, wetness in my mouth and my throat again. And I started to, to talk a little more normally. And, uh, and, and that was a great feeling. And then, um, you know, that at the same time I was being taken off the pain pump, um, you know, my throat's dry and all that sort of stuff. So when it starts to get moist again, there's all kinds of crap in there that I want to shake loose, you know, and you normally do that by making yourself cough. And of course I'm not used to having five incisions through my abdomen. Um, so of course the first thing I think to do is to just sort of give a, a, a brief little cough to sort of, you know, shake that stuff loose so I can spit it out. And, and that's when I get introduced to the, the pain that I, that I'm really in. Uh, when I'm just on uh, like Percocet as opposed to this like narcotic stuff that's being, uh, you know, run through my IV. And uh, I, if memory serves, I kind of yelped like a dog and I was like, oh shit, this is okay. So this is, this is when it gets real. And um, so then, you know, I spent the next week or so after that trying desperately to avoid coughing or sneezing or laughing or anything like that, because it was all just so so painful on the incisions and uh thankfully most of that's over by now there's still a little bit of that uh but i can like full belly cough now without really any pain and uh, laughing doesn't really hurt and um i only really feel pain now if i try to bend like all the way over to pick something up um or if i'm like extra active you know they kind of get a little irritated and and that hurts a little bit but and then it's mostly over with by now um and then so, uh, you know, once I was able to, basically once I was able to pee on my own and, uh, you know, I was able to keep fluids down without throwing them up, uh, I was able to go home and, uh, you know, the, the peeing thing was kind of touch and go there for a minute. They, uh, you know, they took the catheter out, which God, that was not fun. First time that's ever, you know, that was a lot of, a lot of firsts for me. Um, first time that was ever done and it was not fun. I hated it real, real bad. Um, especially cause I don't like strangers around my genitals, but, um, you know, basically they're like, well, you know, you seem to be holding fluids down really well. So as soon as you pee on your own, you can get out of here. And I mean, I was just sipping water like crazy. Like I, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I need to pee. And, um, you know, and it was like, you know, it's by like eight o'clock at night, you know, we may have a problem if you're, you know, if you're not able to pee and they're talking about using a catheter to empty my bladder. And I'm just like, Oh God, I don't want that to happen. And, um, you know, it, it, it really got down to the wire and the nurse was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go do this one thing. And if you haven't peed by the time I've come back, like I'm going to get a, a scanner to scan your bladder and see if it's full. And, you know, no sooner did she leave the room. I was like, all right, I'm going to get up and try to do this. And sure enough, it all, it all came out. And I was just like trying really hard not to laugh because it was just really funny. Like, Oh my God, I peed. Um, I had, I had the nurse thing and I was like, I peed. And, uh, you know, so I was able to go home with, you know, the miles of paperwork and, you know, my, my, uh, prescriptions and all that stuff. And, um, and then the ride home may actually have been the most excruciating pain I've ever felt in my life. And, um, I, I say that as a person who hasn't experienced a lot of painful things. So maybe it was mild in comparison to other things, but it's definitely the worst experience I've probably ever had. Um, and trust me, it's not because Celeste is a bad driver. Celeste is probably the the best and most cautious driver I know. Um, it's just, you know, basically any movement, any, you know, bump in the road, any of that kind of stuff was just terribly painful. Um, and I mean, you know, anybody who's been through that kind of pain knows how much it can drain you. And I was just like, I was just ready to sleep for five days when I got home. Um, but you know, I was, I was taking, I was taking pain meds and they were making me a little loopy. Celeste has this really cute picture of me on her phone where I'm taking those little medicine cups and giving myself bug eyes. And I thought that was kind of the most hilarious thing ever. Um, (laughs) and, uh, it's like, it's a terrible picture, but it's really funny. And, um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and that was basically the routine for a couple of days. I mean, I would, you know, lay on the couch trying to avoid pain, sipping water, uh, eventually eating a little bit of puree, um, you know, getting up to go to the bathroom and that kind of stuff, trying to, to move and walk around without, you know, feeling a whole lot of pain. Um, I hate the way narcotic painkillers make me feel. I don't like that high feeling. I don't like being loopy. I don't like being out of control. I don't like my senses being dulled like that. 
Um, I, I just, I hated every second of having to take those meds. I was really grateful that they made me hurt less, but, uh, you know, those side effects were not things that I enjoyed at all. So, um, I definitely got off those as quickly as I could. And thankfully it's been a little over a week since I had a dose. And even the last one that I took was kind of a cautionary thing because I was doing something that I thought might cause me pain, but I ended up, I probably could have gone without that too. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously Christmas was four days after my surgery and I was still pretty, pretty not mobile at that point. But, uh, you know, I'm super grateful to have Celeste and to have my family just 100% supportive and like, yeah, we'll come over and we'll do presents and stuff at your house. And, um, you know, everybody had Christmas dinner, which was, was fine at that point. I didn't even have an appetite. It was like, you know, ham and mashed potatoes and green beans and stuff like that. It's like all food that I really, really love. I didn't care for, I didn't like, I didn't want any of it. I just had zero appetite. It's like, I'm just over here sipping my water and that's all fine. Um, and, uh, and eating my, <laughs> eating my puree. And, um, and, and so like, I was still able to have a good Christmas, which, which is awesome. Um, you know, it would have been nice to to eat real food, but you know, I still had a good time. Still got to spend time with people I loved and, uh, and, and that was good. And, um, you know, there, there've been, there've been some struggles. Um, you know, I, I posted on Facebook just earlier today. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time on Facebook sort of sharing my, my triumphs and, uh, you know, the, the good things that have come from this and, and the, you know, the progress of my recovery, uh, and, and that kind of stuff, because, you know, I, I mean, I, I like sharing with my friends how I'm doing and where I'm at. And I know people, people want to know and, and people care. And, um, you know, it's also sort of a solidarity thing, you know, people, uh, I have a couple of friends who are considering doing this surgery. Um, so, you know, it's nice for them to see a perspective of somebody who's doing it or, uh, someone who's considering it, uh, you know, just, just to know, to know the full story. So like, I thought it was, I thought it was important for me to post the, you know, the sort of negative side of things to, um, I, uh, up until recently had not been handling the whole like eating pureed food thing very well. Um, so, so basically for the first, uh, two weeks of, um, of your, your post-surgery, you have to eat food that's pureed, uh, into the consistency of like paste or like baby food or, um, applesauce, like that kind of stuff. Um, because, you know, your stomach's healing and anything, you know, harder than that can, uh, can, you know, break your, uh, your staple line, pop a stitch, you know, cause a leak. And I mean, you could literally die. It's, it's not, um, you know, it'll sabotage your progress or it'll hurt or you'll throw up. Like it, it could literally kill you. Um, so, you know, before I had a choice, if I wanted to have a meal and, you know, maybe set my prog- progress back a little bit, because that's what I wanted. I had that choice and I, and, and I was able to do it. Uh, um, I, I was able to do it at a frequency that didn't hamstring my progress, but I don't have that choice now, uh, or, or I might die. Um, so the, the complete lack of texture just, I just couldn't handle it. Um, I, I don't have, uh, you know, my eating problems aren't necessarily like I feel bad. Therefore I eat. It's more like I eat. And when I don't eat stuff that I feel satisfied with, I feel bad. Um, and, and I don't just mean feel bad as in like, I'm annoyed with it. I mean, it causes me serious emotional issues, um, to the point of, of actual depression. And, uh, and, and I got there for, for a little bit of time. Uh, I, I, every time I ate puree, I wanted to throw it across the damn room. And, um, I was, I was snapping at Celeste over little things because I was annoyed about other things, which I feel terrible about. Um, I was just, it was just, just not in a good place. Um, I, I was, I was really tired of the physical limitations, uh, not being able to help out with things, uh, you know, having to ask for help constantly all the time for everything. Um, it, it's really important for me to feel like a relationship is a partnership. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a two way street, you know, we're both putting things in and, uh, and obviously I understand sometimes one person's going to put in more than the other because, uh, of circumstances, like, I don't know, like a life changing <laughs> surgery, for example, um, you know, intellectually, I know these things, but it doesn't stop me from feeling terrible about this, you know, extra burden that I've, that I've placed on my partner, uh, my girlfriend, the person I love, uh, you know, be because of doing this. And, um, you know, she's dealing with me physically, taking care of my food, taking care of my drinks, taking care of me emotionally. And I just felt like I had so little to give back. And, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily about keeping score. It's not like, I feel like, like, Oh, she did this thing. So I got to do this thing to pay her back. Like, I don't feel like that, 
but uh but i i just i had a, a a real struggle with the fact that i felt like i was just taking and taking and taking and taking and was not able to give anything back um and, and that really messed with me and um i mean literally just in the last day or two uh i i've i've sort of gotten past that and sort of settled into the routine and um and and i i think i'm in a good place i've i've got puree for another week uh and that doesn't make me cringe or want to throw things or ain't or be angry like it uh like it has before um i i'm I'm mobile enough now that i'm pretty well independent i mean i can you know drive places on my own and do housework and stuff like that i still can't really lift heavy things or bend over and do things but like you know just general like if i want to clean the house a little or if i want to go run an errand or go visit somebody like i can do that independently now so i like i feel feel pretty okay about that um pain is pretty minimal like on a scale of one to ten the worst i've felt in the last week has probably been like a four um and and that's just because of the incisions i mean you know they shoved instruments through holes in my stomach like obviously that's gonna that's gonna cause (laughs) that's gonna cause some issues um but uh but i'm in a good place right now i had my two-week follow-up visit today actually which I'm, i'm recording this on wednesday um and my doctor's thrilled with my progress. Dietitian was super impressed with my food journal and uh, the things that I've been eating. And I've been I've been able to get in enough fluids. I haven't, uh, you know, food intolerance can be a thing. People stop tolerating certain foods after surgery, and I have not really run into that aside from uh, you know I tried one puree recipe that I didn't even really like the taste of anyways, but um, but it had beef in it, and I, I think my stomach sort of rebelled a little bit against me, um, and. Uh, and it was just a mildly upset stomach. Like it was not that big of a deal. Um, really the biggest thing that's happened so far is I, I had a, a run in with what's called dumping syndrome, which can happen either when you eat too fast or you eat fatty foods or sugary foods. Um, basically what happens is they, uh, they get shoved out of your stomach into your gi- digestive tract before uh, they're ready and your body just flips the hell out. Um, so it's, you know, extreme dizziness, nausea, sometimes vomiting, sometimes diarrhea, disorientation, tunnel vision, the whole nine. And this happened while I was in the shower. Um, I was scared out of my mind. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully it only took about, it only took probably five minutes or so to pass. Uh, but it was, it was easily one of the worst feelings I've ever felt in my life. I don't ever, ever, ever want to go through that again. Um, so that's, you know, another reason I'm being very, very careful to just do literally exactly what my dietitian tells me to do and nothing else, even if it makes me a little miserable. Um, cause I want to stay safe. Obviously I did this because I want my health to be good and I want to live a long time. So I'm doing my best not to screw it up. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I very much internalize the idea that this surgery is a tool. It's not a solution unto itself. Um, you know, you can, you can make bad decisions and still screw th- and to still screw things up. Um, you know, I've given a lot of thought to the idea of weight loss and celebrating weight loss and pursuing weight loss and that kind of stuff as a person who identifies as, you know, a a body positive feminist. I, I don't attach a moral value to, to my weight. I I don't think, you know, being skinny is inherently good. Being fat is inherently bad. That's just, it's, it's overly simplistic and it's just plain not true. People can be really unhealthy while skinny and really healthy while fat. Um, I made the decision strictly for my health. I'm not obsessed with any uh, arbitrary scale numbers. I mean, I'm I'm tracking my numbers because I want to know my progress and I want to make sure that the surgery is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, And and it's a a very easy way to see, you know, where I'm at on the progression of mitigating the symptoms of the things that that are the real reason that I started to do this. Um, So, uh, you know, it's not... I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a little vanity involved. I do live in the same culture as everyone else where we're obsessed with, you know, beauty and uh, size and and that kind of stuff. And there's definitely some, some internalized fat phobia, I guess, happening there. Um, But, you know, when it comes right down to it, vanity is not really the reason that I did this. And, And I think, uh, vanity would be a bad reason for me to have done this. Um, you know, I, I, I did it as a health decision. Um, anything else, maybe a bonus if I'm happier with the way that I look, whatever. Uh, but, but it, it you know, it, it's really about health and, and, and I, I spent a lot of time sort of unpacking that and, you know, seeing if there was, if seeing if there were any of those sort of attitudes 
at play here. Um, and you know what, maybe there were, uh, but, but when it comes down to it, uh, my doctors thankfully were really good about giving me a realistic vision of what to expect. And, uh, you know, the idea, like if you go on YouTube, you can find a million people talking about how bad weight loss surgery is and how, you know, people who had it, who, you know, it was a mistake and universally they have one of two things in common. One, they had the wrong attitude, i.e. I'm going to do this. I'm going to lose a bunch of weight and it's going to be easy and it's going to be no big deal. Or there were sort of other mitigating uh, health problems that that sort of interconnected with this to make it harder or less effective. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that my doctor just beat into my head. Like, look, this is a tool. Um, it's a powerful tool. It's an effective tool. But if you don't use it correctly, you can still screw it up and you can go right back to the way that you were before. Uh, it's it's not a cure all. It's uh, it, it's not it's not a solution unto itself. Um, and, and that's the thing that I've really sort of internalized, uh, you know, it's not over once, you know, the period stage is over and, um, you know, starting, uh, a week from today, I can start eating soft foods so like boiled chicken and, um, you know, lunch meat, the shaved really thin and that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then three weeks after that, I can start, you know, my quote unquote forever diet where I'm eating regular food again, just, you know, depending on what I can tolerate and how much I can eat. Um, it's not over at that point. You know what I mean? Like it, obviously the amounts are going to be severely restricted. Uh, but if you, you know, power through that, you can stretch your stomach back out and go right back to being able to eat the same amount that you were able to eat before, um, negating the entire <laughs> effect of the surgery. Um, you know, I have to take multivitamins every day because I, you know, you don't get enough uh, nutrients from that small amount of food. Um, so that's a thing you can screw up. Um, really, really thankful that starting literally today, I was able to not crush my pills up anymore. Um, any pill basically bigger than an M&M, they tell you that you need to crush, uh, because your, uh, your stomach can't really handle something that big, uh, for the first two weeks. And, um, I don't know if anyone's had to crush their pills before, but drinking chalky water is one of the worst things. And, uh, and thankfully that's over today. I don't have to do that anymore. So I'm really glad about that. Um, uh, so the future is looking bright. You know, I am, um, I, I've definitely learned a lot about myself through this process and sort of what uh, a lot of emotional triggers are with me surrounding food. Um, and, and even, you know, stuff sur- surrounding, you know, relationships and, and living and just sort of life in general. Um, you know, as you know, the, with, even with the struggles that I've had, I, uh, I still 100% think that I made the right decision. Um, m- a lot of people that I know that have had the surgery uh, warned me that, you know, that a lot of people go through a period, uh, like a short period near the beginning where they regret having the surgery because of, you know, how, how much of an adjustment it is. And then they sort of eventually come around and like, yeah, I don't regret it anymore. I'm, I'm glad. And I haven't really gotten to that stage yet. I mean, I, I've definitely been surprised and angered and annoyed and, uh, you know, depressed about the fact that certain things were a little harder than I anticipated they would be. And, you know, I I definitely wished they weren't that hard. Um, but there's never been a point really where I've been like, God, I I, I wish I didn't do this. Um, so, um, you know, I'm still 100% convinced that this was the right decision for me long-term for, for my health and for my well Uh, and it's obviously, it's going to enable me to get bottom surgery later. Um, the surgeon that I'm going to wants you to have a BMI of 40 or less, which means that I have to hit 270, which is about 50 pounds away from where I am now. Um, so, um, so yeah, things are looking up that that's really the, that's really the meat of my story. Um, I am 100% happy to answer questions. I'm anybody who listens to the show knows how much of an open book I am. And that doesn't just extend to trans stuff. Uh, when it comes to this journey, I'm always open to, to questions and discussions and hearing from people, um, if, you know, comments, questions, uh, you know, anything like that, obviously, um, you know, uh, obviously you want to, you know, seek the advice of a doctor and, uh, you know, medical and mental health professionals are always, you know, they're the experts. They're definitely the ones who know what they're talking about, but, um, you know, for perspective and advice or, uh, insight or anything like that, I'm, I am always available and that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto on Secular Media Network. Um, 
You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Manifesto. You can email us at thegatheistmanifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at GatheistCali. You can find the show on Twitter at TheGatheist. And obviously there's no RE outro. We're all very, very sad. If you want to support the show and the activism we do, you can head to patreon.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto and make a per episode donation as little as a dollar per episode. You can also head over to iTunes and give us a five star review that helps us get heard by a lot more people. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared. If you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is the Atheist Manifesto.